Throughout history, societies have made choices about what to produce. From microchips to chocolate chips. From blue corn tortillas to blue jeans. From motor oil to castor oil. There are strings attached to these production decisions. A society's production possibilities are always tied to its limited resources and its technological limits. Determining which goods and services to produce are choices about the use of an economy's factors of production. Factors of production are the resources the economy has available to produce goods and services. These include capital, such as buildings, machinery, and equipment, labor, which includes the number of workers, education, and skill levels, and natural resources. How a society chooses to utilize or allocate its factors of production influences living standards and rates of income growth. While a society's needs and wants are boundless, its resources are limited. Achieving efficiency and increasing productivity are major economic goals. This is true for an entire macroeconomy as well as for an individual microeconomic business. You can't judge a book by looking at the cover. The use of factors of production in a relatively small firm represents a microcosm of choices made throughout macroeconomic systems. To assess an economy's potential use of its resources, we turn to a graph called the Production Possibilities Curve, or PPC. For purposes of simplification, a production possibilities curve assumes that an economy is producing only two goods. Another assumption of the PPC is that technology and the factors of production are fixed in both quantity and quality for a particular moment in time. For a bookstore, some of the capital resources to be considered include square footage, number of displays, and types of displays. These all play a role in choosing how many different kinds of products and how many units of each product can be offered for sale. The choices range from stocking all books and no music, to stocking all music and no books, and all the possible combinations in between. In this hypothetical example, if the store offers 260,000 units of music, there would be no space available for books. The other extreme would be to offer 130,000 books, leaving no room for music. The store could add music items by giving up space for books. The cost of offering 20,000 music items means giving up the space for 10,000 books. No matter which combination is chosen, there is a cost. In each case, the cost for stocking one good is giving up space for the other. This is referred to as opportunity cost. A PPC is downward sloping because of scarcity and opportunity cost. Displaying more of one good means displaying less of the other. There are limits in terms of the amounts of goods and services that can be offered or produced. In this case, square footage is a fixed resource that limits the quantities of books and music that can be physically displayed. This simplified example illustrates the resource constraints that a traditional business must face. It also illustrates a constant opportunity cost, which is portrayed graphically by a straight line production possibilities curve. A concave production possibilities curve is a better representation of reality. A concave or bowed out curve illustrates the law of increasing opportunity cost. Resources are not equally suitable for all types of production. Therefore, 
As more of one type of good or service is produced, opportunity cost rises. Scarcity demands that societies, much like individual businesses, must make choices about how to use limited resources. Scarcity forces us to choose among alternatives. In the use of natural resources, choices can be affected by both human activities and by occurrences in nature. This makes assessing production possibilities difficult. This is certainly true when it comes to commercial fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. There it comes. Resource management, particularly with a living marine resource, is one of the most complicated and challenging sciences that we face today. How do you keep the numbers of the population stable to where they can keep sustaining that population numbers. And at the same time, allow the, those that want to harvest this, whether it be uh, through commercial means, or recreational means, afford them that opportunity to do so. Uh, we have the constant conflicts between the commercial and the recreational. You know, the commercial people are trying to make a living by harvesting this resource. There are also tens of thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars that are tied up in their ability to go out and catch this fish on a recreational basis. Putting values on these, whether it's the organisms or the habitat, is a difficult thing to do. If we look at the commercial value of certain species, we can do that easily. But those commercial species can't exist without the rest of the organisms, the quality of the water, and the habitat that's there. It's a very dynamic uh, interaction uh, within any marine ecosystem. And it, one of the things that's not really understood by the general public is that this dynamic interaction that exists in the ocean is very much affected by what's happening on land, what's happening in the rivers and in the watershed areas. Essential habitat is the terminology that's used uh, for those species that we must have the right kind of habitat if we're going to sustain that fishery. For the quality of the estuary and especially the wetlands are key to their existence and their long-term survival as well as the abundance each year. If we damage the wetlands, then we're reducing the shrimp catch for the next year. If you go to any of the Gulf Coast states, you know, whether it be Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, shrimp is a, a big issue. It accounts for hundreds of millions of dollars of, of economic activity. Thousands of, of people are dependent upon the shrimp industry. Full employment of resources is an important goal. This is achieved by producing a combination of goods and services that lies on a production possibilities curve. If the choices made in a society reduce the quantity or quality of natural resources, then the economy will experience an economic decline, ceteris paribus. Most societies strive toward increasing production possibilities or achieving economic growth, which in turn may improve the quality of life. Individual producers, as well as societies, seek efficiency in utilizing their resources and available technology. Wow, this net here is a pretty good net. It's got a lot of web and it's, it's, built, it's built by one of the best net shops. To catch good shrimp, you gotta have good equipment, you know. The equipment we use nowadays, the horsepower is a lot, you know, we're using a lot stronger motors nowadays. Uh, different different types of rigging, bigger boats. Years ago, we didn't have no no death recorders. We didn't have nothing at all. All we had was a little old radio, and that was all. All of our equipment come from the military. Everything the military was getting rid of, the people used to go buy everything from the military. Radios, transmitters, death recorders, Lorans, everything was surplus. The shrimping vessels have gotten larger, more powerful, uh, more sophisticated. The net technology itself has improved so that they can actually go and scour the ocean bottoms trying to get the shrimp up out of the mud and into the net. Then they can bring it up on the deck. It's very effective at bringing in shrimp. It also brings in a lot of other things. By catch reduction device, a BIRD, B-R-D, is as commonly known as a piece of technology that allows the incidental catch to escape, so it's not ever brought up onto the deck of the uh, shrimp boat. 
there are a lot of economic issues uh, associated and certainly controversy anytime you try to force a new technology onto an industry. The natural human tendency is to say, wait a minute, what works now is working for me, I'm paying my bills, I'm supporting my family, why are you trying to make me change? So we have, again, all these dynamics, the human conflicts going on over this. Um, it's just kind of a ne never-ending cycle, and uh, I suppose uh, as long as uh, resource managers can successfully manage the population to where it stays sustainable, well, then there will always be a shrimp fishery. If it falls below sustainability, there's no fishery. So it's that simple. No, I believe there's just as many shrimp. You just got more boats fishing them, that's all. I believe the, the shrimp is just about the same. When you take a piece of pie and you cut it in six slices, you got six people eating. Then you try to put 10 people eating that six slices, you got to cut it smaller. So each one gets a little bit less. And I believe that's the way with the shrimp boats. Everybody's getting a little bit less because we got more boats. While technology has increased the productivity of Gulf Coast fishermen, this productivity has resulted in the depletion of some marine resources. But other technologies have been developed to help offset these effects. Now since 1982, we've put in over 280 million red drum fingerlings and over 12 million spotted sea trout fingerlings. And due to this stocking effort, we've seen the red drum and spotted sea trout populations rise in all bay systems along the Texas coast. Now in order to get them to spawn on our facility, what we do is we condense the 365 day year down to 150 days and that way we're able to get all our fish to spawn twice a year instead of just once a year. Many of the natural reefs in the Gulf of Mexico have undergone serious erosion problems causing shortages of habitat for fish. But many species gravitate toward oil and gas platforms that scientists have dubbed artificial reefs. Within two or three days of setting a platform, fish begin to congregate around it. Then we start to see some of the reef fish will come in as juveniles and set up and stay there, going through their complete life cycles there. They will grow, they will reproduce and spawn, they will consume other organisms, and eventually they will be consumed by organisms there. Now one of the primary areas that we study here at the Center for Coastal Studies is the productivity of artificial reefs. I have personally observed some just astounding catches by commercial fishermen around platforms. And this is the product that ends up on your plate when you go into a restaurant and order hamburjack or perhaps red snapper. An economy that relies on the diversity of natural resources often confronts some of the most difficult and intriguing economic issues. Because of human demand for the living natural resources, we're going to see the management of these resources become even more complicated and perhaps even more contentious in the future. Uh, with demand by recreational fishers, demand by commercial fishers who supply restaurants, will all drive an increase in pressure on the resource managers who have been entrusted to ensure that these resources stay sustainable, not only for us, but for all future generations to come. A necessary condition of growth is change change in some aspect of our resources. A society that's fully employing its resources will be operating on the production possibilities curve. This means maximum production efficiency with the given factors of production and technology. Economic growth occurs when something impels the curve to shift outward. In other words, when technology or a factor of production increases. This change is reflected in an increase, an increase in the physical quantity or in the quality of an economy's factors of production. Quantity refers to more of something, more oil, more commercial airplanes, more people. Quality refers to improvements in technology and improvements in human capital through education and training. 
The internet is a technological advancement that allows for greater output with the same level of input, thus increasing our production possibilities. At the same time, the new technologies demand new skills on the part of employees. An increase in human capital also contributes to the shift in the curve. The internet by lowering costs of communication benefits lots and lots of different industries. Communication is, uh, is one aspect of business. Uh, it's an input to some extent that, that businesses use in creating their final product. It allows them to sell their product as well. Well, I think the internet from, a, from an economic model standpoint has created tremendous value. For example, at Garden.com, we have what we call the, a virtual warehouse concept, where we hold hardly any inventory of our product. What that allows us to do is have none of the inventory carrying costs or the large distribution center costs that a traditional mail order company or a retailer would have. It creates a fundamentally different cost model that creates an enormous amount of value creation um, on the back end. The internet has been especially beneficial for small businesses like Garden.com, a one-stop shop for gardening information, products and services on the World Wide Web. Beginning with three employees in 1996, the company had grown to 200 employees by the end of 1999. Well, the internet is really the key enabler that allows companies like Garden.com that are relatively small to have a very big impact and a very big um, imprint, if you will, on the larger um, population and the consumers. Because the internet connects, um, allows us to create one place that virtually any number of millions of people can visit again and again and again, we have incre incredible economies of scale. So in other words, we build one storefront for the entire world to visit, and every additional person that keeps coming to the website or to our store doesn't require us to really sink any more costs in. Obviously, we've got to scale our systems and our overall computing power as we grow larger and larger, but the cost of doing that is really much smaller than if we had to build a bricks-and-mortar store. And certainly, from a staffing standpoint, we don't have to have nearly the amount of people that it requires to touch each individual consumer like you would in a physical retail format. The Internet's pace of adoption eclipses all other technologies that preceded it. Radio was in existence 38 years before 50 million people tuned in. Television took 13 years to reach that benchmark. Once it was open to the general public, the internet crossed that line in four years. And it didn't stop there. Information technology industries have been growing at more than double the rate of the overall economy. Retail revenues from online shopping increased dramatically in the final years of the 20th century and are expected to continue to grow rapidly. And information technology workers earned, on average, 40% more than other individuals in the private sector. Well, the Internet has created an enormous amount of demand for skilled laborers, especially in the information technology and the development areas. Garden.com has a, a large staff of programmers, um, database technicians, and other experts in the IT information technology areas. At the same time, these high-wage, high-skill workers are adding value far beyond the possibilities in traditional business models. The extra value that's created by creating this incredibly efficient channel, we believe, ultimately benefits the consumer. We have ultimately, as we reach scale as a business, a much um, greater potential to generate um, more margin. What we can do is then funnel that money into what we think of as our bricks and mortar of our store, which are the content and information services that are all free at our website. So we have an entire staff of gardening editors and writers that are creating an enormous amount of content on a weekly and a monthly basis. We also have information services, garden design services, advice, and then specific relevant information like our garden doctor service. All of that is free, and we can offer all of that to our customers and really create a much better value proposition ultimately for the consumer because of the efficiencies of the business model. An economy that achieves increased production possibilities may do so by reducing current consumption in order to produce more capital. This implies that expanded production capabilities involve time, 
and deferred consumption in exchange for more consumption later. Like any other capital investment, um, the internet required investment in someone's time and effort and money. I think that the power of the internet to fundamentally change the way people do things in a variety of categories is really taking hold. And I think as in general, the overall population is getting more and more educated into how to use the internet. And as bandwidth increases and as speed increases, we'll have more and more capabilities as folks creating internet experiences, shopping experiences, information services, to ultimately make consumers really be able to seamlessly integrate it into their lives. The internet is a resource that presents an interesting dichotomy. It expands our horizons and our production possibilities. At the same time, it makes the world a smaller, more interdependent place. The term global economy is not just a convenient phrase. International trade has risen rapidly since the end of World War II, in part because the costs of international communication and transportation have declined significantly. This is increasingly so as the internet continues to forge a low-cost travel route across international borders. While the volume of trade between countries has increased, so have the economic interdependencies. Understanding how these relationships contribute to a country's economic health is another use of the production possibilities curve. Without international trade, a country is limited in its ability to produce goods and services based on its level of technology and resources. If countries choose to produce goods and services with the lowest opportunity cost and trade with each other, each nation benefits and attains output beyond its capabilities. When a country has resources well suited for certain types of output, the opportunity cost in terms of other output is low. This is called comparative advantage. Comparative advantage leads to international trade. Production of heavy equipment requires large capital investment and technological ability. Areas in which the United States is strong this makes the production of heavy equipment advantageous to the U.S. and gives the country a comparative advantage. For example, Terex, which makes heavy industrial machinery, thrives in the international market by using the United States' comparative advantage in manufacturing. International trade is very important uh, to the success of our business because we're basically a global company operating around the globe and we cannot be successful without penetrating a new market. Our ability to penetrate Latin America or Eastern Europe or the Far East is critical in our ability to grow and become more profitable. In contrast, many of the customers Terex sells to are in countries where coffee is the chief export. Coffee production depends on climate, topography, and an abundance of low-wage labor, giving nations such as Brazil and Colombia a comparative advantage. The major advantage in a country like Brazil is the we it's, it's weather, as always, the infrastructure, and the climate, period. And of course, in the case of Colombia, most of the coffee is grown in the mountains, mountainous area, because volcanic soils and higher elevations how I'd make for better characteristics in the taste of coffee. By producing goods with a comparative advantage, instead of trying to achieve economic independence, trade allows countries to enjoy greater wealth. For example, the United States could choose to produce all the coffee it consumes. This would take enormous quantities of resources that could be used for other production. But suppose the U.S. could trade a 100-ton dump truck for 300,000 pounds of Brazilian coffee. The United States production possibilities curve would illustrate the freeing up of resources resulting from the country's decision to produce less coffee. These resources can then be used for further production of heavy equipment. When countries produce goods and services where they have a comparative advantage, 
and then trade with each other. Both countries benefit and reach output combinations beyond a country's production possibilities without trade. The essential benefit of international trade is I can buy some things more cheaply if I buy them from another country than I can buy them at home. And foreigners can buy some things more cheaply here than they can buy at home. And so we both benefit from trade. International trade is a long-standing force in the world economy. Today, more than ever, international trade is at the core of global economic prosperity. Production Possibilities Curves attempt to simplify a complicated and dynamic subject. Whatever countries produce, the underlying economic goals are the same. To make choices about their resources that lead to efficient production to specialize in areas that allow greater benefit, and to rely on trade in areas where they do not have a comparative advantage. This allows for a wider choice of goods and services and greater global prosperity. Production choices in a world of scarcity are often challenging, and economic growth may depend on how society uses its scarce resources.